Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. During the second episode on the history of Dajjal, we discussed his progress within the Likud party and his first political battles, his meeting with his teacher Iblis, until his self-proclamation as Prophet Alisa ibn Maria. In this new episode, we are going to describe the stages which will lead him from the declaration of Prophet until the proclamation of his divinity. After killing and resuscitating the child, all the Jews around Dajjal testified and believed in him. When they had just experienced was identical to the miracles performed by Prophet Isa Dajjal then raised his hand and said, I did not just come for the Jewish people, but I came for the salvation of all people. From now on, abandon all religious practices and limit yourself to my instructions. I also appeal to all communities around the world, regardless of their religion. Come join my mission, because soon I will cancel all the economic agreements that Imam al-Mahdi has signed with other Western countries. At this precise moment, anyone who does not join my mission will be one of the big losers. So now that this mission is in your interest, finishing his speech, Dajjal announces to them, I will meet you next week inside the mosque Al-Aqsa. I intend to hold a public speech there. Everyone applauds at the end of the speech. The takeaway is that Dajjal started his attacks on the Muslim world. The very fact of giving a speech inside the sacred mosque is a clear provocation. From this moment, all opponents of Imam al-Mahdi's mission begin to rally Dajjal, Masonic lodges, followers of other religions, but also and above all, the CIA and Masud, who have always failed in their many attempts to assassinate Imam al-Mahdi. This is a golden opportunity to be seized, even if Dajjal is not the Prophet Isa, but the Antichrist. His first speech upset the Muslim world, a way to counteract the mission of the Mahdi, then presents itself to them. Worse, in Arab and Muslim countries, some have started to believe in Dajjal as the Messiah. According to them, since the mark Kafir to be inscribed on his forehead is not visible, the character in question was not Dajjal. In reality, they do not know that Dajjal will not be born with the mark Kafir but it would arrive later in his life. All this is just a pretext for believing in the possibility that Dajjal could be the Prophet Isa ibn Maryam. Indeed, the latter fear the economic repression measures announced by Dajjal, especially since most of the leaders of the Islamic world are trying to flee to seek refuge in Mecca or Medina. Meanwhile in Medina, Imam al-Mahdi calls a meeting with his entourage and asks their opinion on the crisis. One of his advisors said, After your enthronement as Amirul Mu'minin, you remove the visa requirement for any Muslim wishing to visit Mecca and Medina outside of the period of Hajj. You made us understand that the holy places were common properties for all believers. We should also note, by virtue of an agreement Concluded with Imam al-Mahdi, Israel guaranteed the freedom of visit to the Al-Aqsa Mosque to all Muslims who wished to go there. No entry visa on Israeli soil was required. This advisor will therefore say to Imam al-Mahdi, wouldn't it be a good idea to make the visa application for Mecca and Medina compulsory again in order to limit the influx of people? Imam al-Mahdi replied, it is true that it is a good idea, but the problem is that those who should stay in their country of residence to organize this measure are all coming here to Mecca and Medina. The situation seemed to be hopeless. It would be a glaring defeat for the Muslim world if Dajjal were to hold an anti-Islamic speech inside the Al-Aqsa Mosque and claim to be the Prophet Isa alayhi salam there. Imam al-Mahdi fought for a moment and then suggested that his companions take the buses back to Mecca, as he intends, to address the Islamic Ummah on Mount Arafat. He demanded that a white horse 
be found for him to stand on to deliver his speech. He also ordered that it be broadcasted live by all Muslim media. The next day, on Mount Arafat, in front of a large number of Muslims, Imam al-Mahdi on his white horse and equipped with his cane began his speech. Many dignitaries holding key positions in Islamic international trade are here in Mecca and Medina. They apologized to us because they were unaware of the instructions they had been given to stay in their country. Their apologies were accepted because they are already here. But what I cannot accept is that Dajjal can destabilize you. Know that we will soon be living through years of crisis and difficulties. All that can save us will be our Iman, our firm belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May everyone renew their belief in Allah. Also, he added, the Islamic Ummah must stick together. Even though there will be divisions, the rest of the Ummah must come together as the opposing camp is preparing a grand coalition. Everyone should realize this and remain in their continued worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I personally will take care of the rest. A reporter walks up to ask a question, but the Mahdi security protocol blocks his way. He orders them to let him come forward. What do you think of the claim of the one who claims to be Isa and whom you nickname Dajjal? He says he will be giving a speech at the Al-Aqsa Mosque and if he succeeds, it will sound like joining his cause in the Muslim world. Especially since Al-Aqsa is the third holiest site in Islam, asked the journalist. It is for this reason that he will never hold a speech inside Aqsa, replied Imam al-Mahdi. With the speech being broadcast live, this response from Imam al-Mahdi caused a stir in Israel. Muslims in the Aqsa Mosque asked Imam al-Mahdi's entourage what attitude to adopt if Dajjal ever entered the mosque. You won't have to do anything. Even if Dajjal enters the mosque, don't get in his way. Don't touch him. Continue to read your Quran, to pray, and continue zikr. But do not interfere, replied Imam al-Mahdi. The Muslim therefore complied with the instructions. Dajjal is asked about the Mahdi speech, which he followed live. It's because you gave him too much power. First, this country, Israel, does not belong to him, and he allows himself to make decisions. But next week... We'll know if I'm going to speak there or not, he replies. On D-Day, 29-year-old Dajjal surrounded by Jews and new supporters make their way to Al-Aqsa Mosque. As he approaches, he sees a Palestinian number of the political wing of Hamas. Arrived at his height, Dajjal burst out laughing, declaring, You are the ones who I feel sorry the most because you know full well that I will not let go of the agreement you signed with my country. The Palestinian replied, We Palestinians believe in Allah, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, and in Imam al-Mahdi we obey. Even if we had heaven, we wouldn't want it. If you are going to throw us into hell, we are ready to endure it, but we will never believe in you. Extremely frustrated by this response, an angry Dajjal takes a firm step towards the mosque. Once there, his procession settles in front of the door and waits for it to enter to deliver the speech that will disavow Imam al-Mahdi. He takes a step into the mosque and sees the faithful Muslims, some praying, others holding their rosaries. As soon as he put his second foot into the mosque, he suddenly sees the mystical representation or hijab of the Prophet Isa ibn Maryam. The mystical representation of Prophet Isa is dressed in a dazzling white jalaba. His face is luminous and radiant. Dajjal is suddenly surprised. He was afraid, thinking that his followers behind him saw the Prophet Isa. He no longer had the courage to move forward. The mystical representation of Prophet Isa staring at him sternly. Faced with this vision, Dajjal steps back and asks his followers, have you seen what I have seen? They tell him, no, we didn't see anything. When he wanted to tell them that he had just seen the Prophet Isa ibn Maryam, he remembered that this is the mission he claims to be. It would then be a total discredit if he had to admit it. 
He recalled his words. Let us all go out to go to the Horeb synagogue. I will make my declaration there. The crowds follows him, walking slowly. They wonder why this change of course. It's as if he has just confirmed the Mahdi's words. The followers of Dajjal were surprised by this route. On the way, Dajjal reflected on how to make up his failure. As he was deep in thought, Iblis got into his car and said, When you start your speech, tell the audience that Imam al-Mahdi wanted to trap you. Tell them since you have mystical powers to bypass any trap, you have finally stepped back to go and speak at the Hurgo synagogue. If you explain this to them, they will no longer pay attention to what Imam al-Mahdi announced, namely that you will never give a speech in the mosque. Arrived in front of the synagogue with his procession, Dajjal gets out of his car, dressed in his yellow mantle, and goes towards the door. The old man in charge of the synagogue and who lives there permanently opens the door. When Dajjal sees him, he smiles at him and asks him, Do you remember me? I will never forget you, replied the old man. Dajjal replies, Twelve years already. Your memory is therefore very good. But the old man didn't say a word and went back to sit inside. The crowd then begins to settle in front of the synagogue. The television cameras are positioned for the retransmission of the declaration. Dajjal stays inside the synagogue for a while and then leaves. In front of the crowd, he declares, I know you are wondering why I did not give my speech inside the Aqsa Mosque, but I will give you a clear explanation. Indeed, the man who is called Imam al-Mahdi wanted to trap me, but I wanted to show him that with my power, no one can trap me. So that's why I backed off at the last minute. A journalist called out to him, Prophet, can we know why and how Imam al-Mahdi wanted to trap you? Dajjal lowers his head for a moment before strengthening up and then says, This man is a real manipulator. I am the Prophet Isa. I am for justice and democracy, and I will not harm any community. If I had performed the speech inside the Aqsa Mosque as originally planned, the imposter, Imam Mahdi, would come out the next day to declare that I had harmed the Islamic community. This is what I wanted to avoid. The journalist retorted, But yet, it was you who said that you were in fact going to make the speech. Yes, I said that, but after reflection, I knew that this man is a real manipulator. I turned back to come here, Dajjal replied. Another reporter stood up and asked, Why do you often call him an imposter and a manipulator? Is there a secret about him that you do not tell us? Or does he interact with you mystically in some way? You really don't know this man. But since I'm not going to spend my time telling you who he is, if you really want to know him, go and find out from his community. I will just tell you what he did this week. Didn't you see him in Arafah, riding his white horse addressing to the Muslims? What you do not know is that it was not aimed only at the Muslim community. He was also sending me a code, Dajjal replied. Can we know what the code in question is? asked the reporter. Dajjal replied, his white horse is the code. By riding this horse, he was letting me know that he was ready for war. It was a declaration of war when you define him as a man of peace. Even if you say so, he doesn't want peace. He also chose the color white to let me know that he is not going to abandon his companions. If you say he is a man of peace, it's because you don't really know him. But that is his problem. The main thing is that I know how to proceed with him. As he was about to broach another topic, another reporter called out to him again. But why would Imam al-Mahdi declare war on you personally? And why does he make it clear that he will not abandon his companions? Dajjal replied, This is normal, because he knows that no army can fight against me. Only mystical power can be used against me. At that moment, the old man comes out of the synagogue. The whole crowd is watching him. He addressed Dajjal in these terms. Personally, I am 88 years old. When we met earlier, you said that 12 years have passed since we first met in this synagogue. 
I would like to send a message to the Jewish people who follow you and to the Jewish National Front. This man is not the Messiah that the Bible predicted. He is rather the Antichrist. Everyone was surprised. The old man continues, Indeed, I certify it by taking my responsibility. He turned to Dajjal. But why don't you take responsibility? Why don't you declare that you are the Antichrist when you confirmed it when we were alone? Why pretend to be the Prophet Jesus? Is power worth it? There was a total silence. Dajjal spoke. Do you see the perverse effects of religions? This old man is 88 years old. Because of his long stays in the synagogue and intense meditations, he was brainwashed. He learned day and night over the text until he called me hypocrite and confused me with the Antichrist while I'm the prophet Jesus. Even if you say it, you don't believe it, replied the old man. Dajjal continued, Okay, but this will be the last word you say against me. He pointed his left index finger at the old man. With his hand bearing the magic ring, he seized him by his mystical power and threw him into the air. With his finger, he made the old man spin to the point of making him dizzy. Suddenly, he struck his hand against the ground and the old man crashed. The violence of the shock that fractured his spine was such that the noise could be heard. A grim silence reigned into the crowd. Dajjal said, If I wanted to, I could resuscitate him, but I won't because he called me a hypocrite. And from now on, Anybody who calls me a hypocrite will suffer the same fate. Some were trembling in the crowd, seized with fear. They believed in him as a prophet, but now they were afraid of him. At the same time in Medina, Imam al-Mahdi finished the prayer of Asr at the sacred mosque. He called four of his companions and informed them of the murder. I just saw the soul of an 88-year-old man killed by Dajjal. The angels bowed and recorded his soul in Lahraf. Dajjal killed someone? Asked the companions. In any case, I saw his soul being carried by angels and it was Dajjal who killed him. He answered. One of the companions confirmed the news a few moments later after seeing the information on the TV channels. Following the murder, a journalist questioned Dajjal. This old man you killed... Everyone knows that he spent his whole life as a person in charge of the place. As you are not going to resuscitate him, have you planned a replacement to succeed him? In response, Dajjal said to him, From today this synagogue is my temple. I will no longer allow a copy of the Bible, the Gospel, or the Quran to be displayed here. It will be my personal sanctuary. The only people I will allow access to will be members of my party, the National Jewish Front. Here, it will be my name that will be glorified. I can't wait to be in the election to show you my power. This is how the meeting ended. The audience stayed on their toes about the speech to be held in front of the synagogue. Rather, Dajjal instead performed a display of power and cruelty to threaten anyone who ventured to contradict him. Now he inspires deep fear in his supporters. After the meeting, Dajjal informed his supporters of his decision to go to the town of Lod for three days before the start of the election campaign. Arrived at his residence, he will meet Iblis the same evening. Iblis warmly congratulates him on the event at the Hurvu synagogue, which he considers an achievement. He adds, The old man whom you killed by using your power, certainly in the case of an anger, allowed you to find a solution that will allow you to win the legislative elections. What do you mean? asked Dajjal. Iblis smiled and replies, Your party, that is the Jewish National Front, has only one opponent, the Likud. The reason for our last failure in the past legislative elections is that the Likud had a well-crafted program while we were only criticizing them. All voters therefore believed that the Likud plan was better for Israeli people. But thanks to what we did yesterday, the Likud will not show up with a program 
but on the opposite, they will limit themselves to criticizing you. When the time comes, don't respond to criticism, but just roll out your program. If you do this, the voters will listen to you, and at the end, the whole debate will revolve around you, and you will easily win the elections. Happy? Dajjal tells Iblis, I had made a decision, but I had thought to share it with you first. About what? Asked Iblis. It's about the yellow mantle that I wear to claim to be the Prophet Jesus. The mantle bothers me, and I would like to take it off to choose another outfit that I like for the next elections. Dajjal replies, Since you already convinced the majority of people, it's no longer worth it. You can take it off and stop riding the donkey, said Iblis. Dajjal then changes his appearance. Now he wears a black suit with a long jacket over it most of the time. He shortens his hair again, as before, and wears a kippah. In addition, he wears around his head a kind of elastic with a piece of leather with which he protects his defective eye like a parrot. At the end of these three days, he left the town of Laud to return to the electoral campaign. From the start, Iblis' prediction comes true. The main opponent, the liquid, spends the entire campaign criticizing Dajjal. If you give him the majority, he will lead the country into chaos. Did you see how he murdered this 88-year-old man? He is not the prophet Jesus. They repeat. The whole liquid campaign resolves around the character Dajjal. Meanwhile, Dajjal and the Jewish National Front roll out their program. They defend a plan based exclusively on international trade. They are keen to denounce agreements with Imam al-Mahdi, which they believe does not favor Israel and Westerners more generally. He thus manages to convince the majority of voters. His platform was so appealing that members of other parties eventually joined him. On the evening of the ballot, the Jewish National Front came first with 100 deputies, while the Likud and his coalition came second with a much lower result. They obtained only a small number of deputies. Dajjal thus won almost all the votes. Having benefited from strong local and diaspora support, he now positions himself as the future Prime Minister of Israel. Following his victory, Dajjal requests an audience with the Israeli president for a special invitation. During the meeting, he told him, I know you are going to appoint me to the post of prime minister, but before my appointment, I would like you to grant me a delay of three years because I have to tour Europe, go to the United States, Africa, and elsewhere in the world. I would like to resolve the problem of these agreements now so that when I take office, we will begin to execute our program. Dajjal managed to convince the president to grant him this time frame. So instead of being prime minister and running the country, he's allocated a private jet to travel. For his first trip, he returned to Manhattan in the United States to meet with Republican and Democratic senators. He urges them to break the agreement signed with Imam al-Mahdi upon his accession to power in place of a new plan that he would propose instead. Dajjal continued, Imam al-Mahdi and his representatives dominate international trade, and until then, we could do nothing about it. Now we can join forces to bring him under our rules. In the past, it was us who risked the embargo, but today, if they refuse, it will be up to us to make them suffer or even impose a boycott of their products. The American senators accept this proposal, which they find brilliant. It will be the foundation of their future economic policy. Dajjal thus continues his tour in Europe, where he will convince the majority of countries. He will also go to Japan, China, and other Asian countries in which he manages to convince. The message is always the same. When I become prime minister, break all agreements. With the exception of some countries like Russia, who preferred to wait for him to take office, Dajjal, during these three years, will have convinced the majority of Western countries to break the agreement signed with the Mahdi, and for some, this was done even before his installation. 
at the end of this three-year tour, he became prime minister and began to govern. He is then 33 years old. He spent the first month responding to messages of congratulations from various world leaders. They took the opportunity to inform him of the effective rupture of the agreements previously concluded with Imam al-Mahdi. Dajjal finally wins his case and savors his victory. Meanwhile, most influential observers, having adopted a neutral attitude in the current context, decided to go to the United Nations, UN headquarters. They are worried about the current state of the world, which is at risk of failing into chaos at any time. Their concern is justified, given Dajjal's hatred towards Imam al-Mahdi, especially since Dajjal, having claimed to be the Prophet Isa, possesses extraordinary mystical power just like Imam al-Mahdi, declared Amir al-Mu'minin. Therefore, observers warned the organization that if no solution is found, the cancellation of the agreements would lead the world into chaos. An appeal that finds a favorable echo with the Secretary General of the United Nations who shares their opinion. The UN decides to organize a peace conference at its headquarters and sends invitations to major leaders, including Dajjal and Imam al-Mahdi. When the United States learned of the initiative, they decided to prohibit access to their territory to Imam al-Mahdi because no agreement binds them anymore. In reality, the ban was taken for the sole purpose of pleasing Dajjal. Even if the UN does not agree with this decision, the peace conference is still maintained. On the day of the conference, the UN reiterated its disappointment at the absence of Imam al-Mahdi because of the refusal of the United States. Despite everything, the UN still suggests that each participant hold a speech of peace, what they will all do with the exception of Dajjal, who will lead a real attack on Imam al-Mahdi. Firstly, he tries to justify the effort to cancel the agreements of several countries signed with Imam al-Mahdi. Then he gives his point of view on the functioning of international trade that should turn to their advantage as well as to Westerners in general. He also proposed to impose an embargo on Imam al-Mahdi and his allies. Finally, Dajjal defends his measures with his long-standing argument, Imam al-Mahdi is an imposter. Most of the leaders present were disappointed to hear such a speech, as they were expecting a message of peace. Now they were apprehensive about the reaction of Imam al-Mahdi and his companions who are also listening to this speech. Once the conference was over, Dajjal went to a Republican senator to tell him that they had managed a big mistake in denying Imam al-Mahdi access to the territory. They could have arrested him directly once he arrived in the United States. Aware of having missed such an opportunity, the senator accepted Dajjal's idea to invite Imam al-Mahdi to the United States. Dajjal thus returned to Jerusalem while the Republican senator, with the help of his contacts and the Jewish lobby, worked on the implementation of this trap. One day in Medina, Imam al-Mahdi surrounded by his companions received a message. One of them told him that it came from the office of the Vice President of the United States. He is very surprised to see that it is an invitation to the American soil for Imam al-Mahdi, as well as a telephone number to dial. In the end, the Republican senator picks up the phone and expresses to Imam al-Mahdi his regret to have seen his country breaking the agreements and not inviting him to the peace conference. Therefore, he would like to invite him for a 48-hour stay in the United States in order to remedy the situation. The date of the meeting is then agreed between the two men. His companions are busy preparing the private jet to accompany him, but Imam al-Mahdi tells them that he will go alone because it is a trap. Wanting to accompany him despite the trap, his companions still wanted to go with him. On the eve of the appointment, Imam al-Mahdi leaves Medina, heading for the United States. In flight, he asks the pilot to immediately go back to Medina once he disembarks because it is a trap. Upon arrival, the pilot obeys Imam al-Mahdi's order.
on the tarmac of the airport, Imam al-Mahdi finds himself alone in front of a row of 20 individuals dressed in black suits, some of them wearing bulletproof vests. In reality, they are FBI agents. The Republican senator greets Imam al-Mahdi and waves to the group of 20 people moving towards the Mahdi. What's going on? Ask Imam al-Mahdi. We must escort you to detention, they replied. He then addresses the Republican senator, asking if the order came from him, his services or his superiors. The senator replies that he has no choice and must escort him to detention for 72 hours. Inshallah, I will not spend more than 10 hours in detention, concluded Imam al-Mahdi. He is then escorted to a cell, measuring approximately two square meters with a chair. Outside, agents are beginning their guard duty when Imam al-Mahdi calls out to the superior. In 30 minutes, you will come see me to find a solution. The superior began to laugh and then walked away. As soon as he left the cell, the Prophet appeared in a sublime white light and asked Imam al-Mahdi to recite the following formula seven times. Ya Allah, kun fayakun. Imam al-Mahdi did so, and an earthquake struck in Washington, California, New York, and other American cities. The superior returned to Imam al-Mahdi in his cell to question him about the ongoing earthquakes. The latter pretended not to know anything about the situation, showing no interest in the question asked. Same attitude, same response. When the superior asked him if these events were related to his arrest. Meanwhile, the earth continues to shake. Overwhelmed by the chaotic situation in the country, the senator, alerted by the superior of the detention officers, went to Imam al-Mahdi's cell. He tells him that he has been informed of the exchange they had before and that necessarily he is at the origin of the current events. He offers to release and allow him a flight back to Medina in exchange for stopping the earthquake to avoid greater disasters. A proposal that Imam al-Mahdi accepts as a solution to the situation. Imam al-Mahdi is therefore released from detention. A private jet awaits him on the tarmac to bring him back to Medina. He refuses to board. In fact, he knows that this is another trap as the device would explode once in the air. The time of the protocols in this world such as getting on private jets to travel is now over. It is now time to show the true mystical power, said Imam al-Mahdi. He recites the formula, Ya Allah kun fayakun, seven times and disappears. He appears instantly in Medina in front of his companions. A crowd of television cameras surrounded him, surprised by his sudden appearance in Medina. Indeed, everyone knew he was in detention in the United States. The Islamic world begins to enter into a great euphoria, chanting Allahu Akbar with the flags raised. In his office, Dajjal became angry when he heard what had just happened. Imam al-Mahdi had just obtained once again a resounding victory over him. So he decided to set up another strategy. He went outside to find his driver and asked him to take him discreetly to the city of Lod without alerting the security protocol. He does not wish to be accompanied. Once there, he asks the driver to turn back in order to not arouse suspicion regarding his absence. He also tells him to keep silent. After taking off his jacket in the bedroom, Dajjal goes to the well in the house. As soon as it is open, he raises his left hand with his ring on it, says his magic spells, and jumps into the well. As he dives in, he meets Iblis, who was heading for the exit. Dajjal told him he couldn't wait any longer. He felt like he hadn't heard the news because of this late release. Iblis replied that he knew what had just happened. Dajjal adds that everything that is happening now is due to a mistake on the part of the United States. Now the Muslim world is victorious again. Iblis replied that he has a solution to this problem. Create a bigger shock than the one the Muslim world is currently experiencing and which will attract all the attention of the media. Dajjal then asked him 
what this is about. Iblis replied, you have already claimed to be the Prophet Isa. Now you have to claim to be God in order to create a bigger shock and draw attention to yourself. From now on, you must use your magical powers like Imam al-Mahdi, replied Iblis. Dajjal accepts Iblis' proposition. Meanwhile, Imam al-Mahdi is in Medina with some of his companions. They have just finished the prayer of Dhuhr and are about to return to their residence. Imam al-Mahdi asks them to move forward so he can get some rest. He lays his green turban on the green carpet of the mosque as a pillow and lies down. In his sleep, he sees in a dream the Prophet peace be upon him, asking him to gather his companions to return to Mecca to formulate an important prayer there. As soon as the dream is over, Imam al-Mahdi wakes up from his rest, which lasted less than an hour, and leaves to join his companions. He told them about the dream he had just had about the Prophet ﷺ and asked them to prepare for the trip to Mecca. Once there, all of them went to their respective residence. At the same time, the Jal of the mystical power of his gold ring joined his office in Jerusalem in the blink of an eye. Upon his arrival, he orders his protocol to organize a rally which would be broadcasted live. All the dignitaries of the Jewish National Front, the deputies and allies of the party, as well as his sympathizers, must be present. The meeting takes place the next day. In front of a large audience, Dajjal speaks. I would like to discuss three points with you. The first point is that I have succeeded in destroying the domain known as Imam al-Mahdi. Because all the agreements he had signed with certain countries are cancelled except Russia, they will surely change their mind if I start a discussion with them. The audience applauds and Dajjal continues his speech in these terms. The second point is that he was invited to the United States to attend the summit, but he didn't show up for fear of being in front of me. The third point is that all of his allies are currently retreating and keeping a low profile. Although yesterday we saw them expressing themselves without much conviction through a television channel. The reason I'm telling you about this is that recently I claimed to be the prophet Isa and you believed me when you saw hard evidence. Today I must confess to you that I am God. Some of the Jews present in the room retreated in shock at what they had just heard. Dajjal adds that if he claims to be God, it is because of everything he has managed to do. The crowd still in shock remains silent. And Dajjal adds, addressing the audience, Do you doubt my divinity? Because if so, I will form a group of more than a hundred individuals to go to each country and make the followers of Imam al-Mahdi adhere to his own cause. At that point, the public starts to applaud. At the same time, the Prophet appears to Imam al-Mahdi in Mecca and informs him that the time has come to formulate the important prayer. Imam al-Mahdi gets up and walks toward the mosque al-Haram, accompanied by his companions. Arrived between the Kaaba and the station of Ibrahim, or Maqam Ibrahim alayhi salam, Imam al-Mahdi stops and repeats the following formula seven times. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, La ilaha illallahul halimul karim, Subhanallah rabbi samawat sab'i, rabbil arshil azim. He ends his prayer with this invocation, Allah, I implore you to show everyone that Dajjal is not what he claims to be, but a disbeliever. Having finished, Imam al-Mahdi rolls his eyes to heaven and sees an angel leaving the ghayb world towards the shahada world using an inayu to rabbaniyu, a mystical means of locomotion. This angel goes to Jerusalem where Dajjal is located and gives him a violent blow on his forehead. The blow struck was so violent that it caused a defeating noise letting the crowd believe that an attack had just occurred. Dajjal was knocked off, balanced by the blow to the point that he almost fell down, but he eventually recovered. When he stands up, the whole crowd is surprised by what they see written on his forehead. Kafir! Dajjal tried to use his mystical powers with his gold ring to make the inscription disappear. 
but unfortunately for him, it becomes even more visible. Dajjal then realizes that he will not be able to remove it and begins to think about a way to justify what had just happened. At the same time, the Ghaib world begins to set up its organization. A second angel leaves fourth heaven to meet the Prophet Isa alayhi salam in second heaven. He hands him a tablet and declares, Today, Dajjal declared to be God. This tablet has a deadline of 40 days. Once the 40 days have elapsed, you will have the authorization to descend into the Shahada world to join him. In fact, the 40 days that the angel refers to correspond to one year and 14 days of this world. Indeed, many speculate on the number of days that Dajjal will spend on earth, but neither of them can say when the countdown will start. However, the count of one year and 14 days will begin when he claims to be God, two months after taking office as prime minister. We also know that Prophet Isa ibn Maryam will spend 40 days on earth, but this time, those 40 days refer to nine years. This indicates that there are several timescales in the Ghaib world. Meanwhile, Dajjal who has no knowledge about what is going on, is in total anger. He tries to think of a way to turn the situation to his advantage. After being stared at by the audience, Dajjal decides to return to the platform. He states that it is this imposter, Imam al-Mahdi, who is behind this inscription on the front. All this in order to discredit me and to pass me off as a disbeliever. The public didn't react after hearing his words. Dajjal continues, I recognize that he has powers which have enabled him to write on my forehead from a distance. But it will cost him dearly because I also have powers and I do not intend to let it go. Among the still silent audience, an old lady of about 70 years old come in front of Dajjal and says, When you pretended to be the Prophet Isa, I was there and I believed you. But today I cannot accept the fact that you claim to be God, even though I am one of your people. Dajjal looks at her and asks if she was there the day he said he would no longer accept anyone who contradicts him. When did you declare it? asked the old lady. I said it in front of my temple the day when this 80 years old man contradicted me, answered Dajjal. I was there, but I can't stand the fact that you claim to be God, reported the old lady. What else do I have to do or prove to make you believe in me? asked Dajjal. I am not contradicting you, but the fact that you claim to be God is inconceivable to me, she replied. Where are your parents? asked Dajjal. They died a long time ago, replied the old lady. Dajjal then holds out his left hand, where his gold ring is located, towards the right shoulder of the old lady, while repeating a mystical formula. He then blows to the right shoulder, and the old lady's father, who had died since a long time ago, appeared to her right side. She was speechless in front of him. Dajjal let her know that he hasn't finished yet. He repeated the same action towards the left shoulder of the lady and made her mother appear. Surprised again, she was speechless in front of her mother. Her parents embraced and expressed their joy of having found her. The audience was so surprised that they were also speechless about what had just happened. Dajjal said, They died a long time ago, and yet I resurrected them. So why are there still people who doubt what I'm claiming? Immediately, the old lady kneels down and kisses Dajjal's hand, telling him that she recognizes him as God. He tells her that she only has 24 hours to spend time with her parents. After this, they will return to the world they came from. In reality, these two people that Dajjal has revealed are Afarids sent by Iblis to assist Dajjal in his demonstration of power. The audience was still in shock at what had happened. The skeptics began to believe Dajjal because, for them, only God was able to do such a thing. It comforted him, but he was not very satisfied, because of the word kafir still visible on his forehead. Addressing the audience, he said, Now I will no longer tolerate 
and a contradiction. I have proved enough. The crowd began to glorify his name. Once the gathering is over, Dajjal returns to his office. He summons his cabinet and justifies the writings on his forehead as a sabotage. He ordered a more severe blockade than that imposed on Palestine to be put in place and all Muslim dignitaries to be arrested. Indeed, since he cannot reach Imam al-Mahdi, his allies will pay for him. A liquidation plan is implemented. Muslims are persecuted, but Dajjal is still not satisfied. He ordered his army to put all necessary means to locate Imam Mahdi, wherever he is throughout the world. The army complies. Under Dajjal's supervision, drones, spy planes, in some, all the means of the army are mobilized for the hunt. Then suddenly, a lieutenant said he had located Imam al-Mahdi. Dajjal gets closer and sees Imam al-Mahdi on the screen. He is dressed in a white jalaba with his green turban on his head. Dajjal orders the target to be locked with the drone. When ordering a strike, another lieutenant claims, I found him too. Dajjal also asks him to lock the target. Shortly thereafter, two others told Dajjal that they had located him. How come so many have found him when he is the same in one person? Dajjal asks them. And yet other lieutenants continue to locate him in various places. In the end, Imam al-Mahdi is identified in 70 different locations, which however will all be locked. Dajjal deduces that this is a manifestation of mystical power, but orders to shoot because it is ultimately the same person. Moments later, news that the airport in the city of Lod had been bombed went through television media. Surprised, Dajjal wonders how this is possible. In fact, all the shots from the armed drones hit the airport in the city of Lod. Dajjal then begins to get angry and claims that they have been manipulated. Despite the 70 targets locked in different locations, all shots were aimed at the same location. He then asks his team to prepare to board the government Boeing. They will head to Mecca, where Imam al-Mahdi made his declaration. His team asks him if that was a good idea, if the world wouldn't view it with a negative eye. Immediately, Iblis whispered in his left ear, to use his mystical powers to influence the rulers of allied countries so he could make them carry out his own decisions and turn the situation in his favor. Dajjal then takes turn joining his allies and instructs them to expel the followers of Imam al-Mahdi from their country if they cannot do so because of their nationality, which guarantees them the residence, then make their living conditions difficult. For example, sharply increase the price of food for the Mahdi's followers and reduce it for those who claims to be Dajjal. Thus faced with constraints, they will abandon Imam al-Mahdi to join Dajjal. Dajjal's allied countries then began to implement the new directives. Facing draconian economic measures, Muslims once again doubt Dajjal's personality, despite the kafir inscription on his forehead. Some changed their minds and considered him to be the Prophet Isa ibn Maryam just to save their interests. Worse yet, they reduce the current situation to a simple personal conflict between Imam al-Mahdi and the one they see as Isa ibn Maryam. Now, with a favorable context, Dajjal can begin his journey to Mecca. He decides to assemble a group of 100 people, 70 of the most experienced soldiers, and 30 members of his protocol. Then, they head to Tel Aviv airport and board the Boeing 747 with five engines. After takeoff, Dajjal explained to the members on board that following the abortive drone attack to eliminate Imam al-Mahdi, it was imperative to travel to Mecca or Medina in order to formally identify and suppress him. Dajjal considers that he can only be in one of these two cities. The lieutenant on board told him that if Imam al-Mahdi was there as he claimed, the aircraft will become a target for defense raiders upon entering Saudi airspace. He suggested that the aircraft be escorted by four F-16 type fighter jets until it landed.
Then Dajjal replied to him, I think you are right, but the escort will not be necessary. I have a mystical power, which by entering airspace will allow me to make ourselves unidentifiable and go unnoticed. Approaching the limits of Saudi's Arabia airspace, the lieutenant turns and asks Dajjal to look in the direction of his left shoulder. The latter turns and sees in the device a bird looking like a white pelican. How did this bird get on board? asks the passengers. Dajjal then stares the bird in the eye. The latter spreads its two wings and opens the beak. The crew then heard surprising formulas. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al fil. Surah 105 Al Fil the Elephant. At this point, the pilot turns to the passengers and tells them that the aircraft has just lost an engine. Dajjal declares that this pelican was not taken aboard by mistake, but rather it is a manifestation of a mystical power. Again, the bird repeats the elephant surah, Surah Al-Fil 105, and a second time the pilot declares the loss of an engine. There are then only three functional reactors. Passengers worry about the risk of further loss if the bird repeats its verse for a third time. The pelican recites Surah Al-Fil, resulting in the loss of a third engine of the device. With only two reactors remaining, the pilot recommends returning to Tel Aviv to avoid the crash in which there may be no survivors. The priority is to spare the lives of the crew instead of the mission to eliminate Imam al-Mahdi. To Dajjal's question as to whether turning around was possible, the pilot replied in the affirmative, and the lieutenant added, Honestly, we have no choice. We have to turn around. It was then that Dajjal ordered the pilot to change course and the bird immediately disappeared. This event plunges Dajjal into a red mist of anger. He has suspected that Imam al-Mahdi would not let such a mission take place. This sequence on board, the aircraft refers to the hadith of the Prophet peace be upon him, mentioning that angels will stand in the way of Dajjal and spread their wings to prevent him from entering holy cities of Mecca and Medina. Many interpreted the Prophet's words by asserting that angels would be physically on earth, wings outstretched, standing guard on the roads leading to the holy cities. In reality, it is indeed that phase on board the plane with this mysterious white pelican which was in fact an angel. Back at Tel Aviv airport, Dajjal asks his army to convene one of the Muslim dignitaries among those previously arrested. One of them is brought in front of Dajjal. Are you a Muslim? He asked him. Yes, I am a Muslim, replied the dignitary. What do you believe in? asked Dajjal. I believe in God. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is my prophet. I obey Imam al-Mahdi's instructions, he replied. Dajjal then extends his left hand, pronounces his mystical formulas on his ring, and his hand turns into a sword. Suddenly, he cuts off the head of the dignitary, who lands further away. I needed revenge on those who constantly work against me, he said. At this precise moment, the sun, on the verge of setting, turns red and a wind of dust begins to rise. In Mecca, the companions and Muslims ask Imam al-Mahdi about the phenomenon that is happening. The Lord sent his wrath to earth. Dajjal has just executed a good man, an innocent Muslim. This is why God reveals his anger, he replies. The atmosphere is darkening and everywhere. Suddenly, drinking water becomes bitter with a salty taste. This sudden change is believed by some to be the result of a probable chemical attack. The media are talking about it everywhere. However, Dajjal pledges to provide all his supporters with clean drinking water. In fact, Dajjal had made significant stocks of drinking water. This is how his army organizes the distribution of drinking water to his supporters, preventing them from using running water that has become inconsumable. 
However, two sources of water remain unchanged, as indicated by Imam al-Mahdi, that of Zamzam in Mecca and that in Medina. As for the others, they provide a whole bit of water unsuitable for human consumption. When the companions ask him how to help believers, Imam al-Mahdi recalls that the solution lies in strengthening their faith in their Lord. To farmers, he predicts that a year of famine and drought is looming. Not a single drop of rain will fall from the sky. A difficult year is ahead. Know that Dajjal works to provide water and food to his supporters, as well as all the amenities they need on a daily basis. For our part, let us try to overcome this trial with endurance, knowing that the Lord is with us. Whoever has the Lord and the Prophet ﷺ by his side is not helpless. Let us think together to overcome this trial, he concludes. Dajjal welcomes the plight of Muslims and intends to take advantage of it to triumph over Imam al-Mahdi. Indeed, he is doing everything to facilitate the daily life of his supporters in this period of crisis. He provides them with drinking water, food, and even funds to finance their activities. Solidarity beyond borders is set in motion to respond to any request. This economic assistance ends up paying off. Across the world, many followers of Imam al-Mahdi end up joining Dajjal's camp with the assurance of a better tomorrow. They live a daily life of shortage of drinking water and food to join the ranks of Dajjal sympathizers who do not suffer any of the ongoing difficulties. This shows that the followers of Imam al-Mahdi who joined the camp of Dajjal are only motivated by the personal interests and are attracted by the material goods of this lower world. Faced with this situation, Dajjal surrounded by his generals in his office relishes his hand on the march of the world. Having proclaimed himself as God, he holds the reins of everything. At the same time, in Mecca, Imam al-Mahdi addresses all of the Muslim faithful throughout a statement. He recommends reciting the entire Surah al-Kafi, or its first four verses, upon waking up and before going to bed. He indicated that this recommendation is necessary. He suspects that Jal is preparing a trick against the faithful and that neglecting it would reveal a flaw in the person. This statement, broadcast by Islamic television channels, reaches all Muslims who take note of the recommendation. Meanwhile, Dajjal reflecting in his office, thinks his dominance is unfinished. Iblis walks into the office and suggests that he take control of the souls of the companions of Imam al-Mahdi and the faithful Muslims through his mystical power. As a result, he will be able to have them attest to the profession of faith that they both created. Indeed, next to the attention of Muslim, faith, the Shahada, proclaiming the oneness of God and the status of the Messenger of Allah of Prophet Muhammad wasallam, Iblis and Dajjal created an attestation proclaiming the divinity of the latter. Iblis adds, that the goal is to have it proclaimed to the souls of the followers of Imam al-Mahdi. Only supporters of Dajjal attest to his divinity so far. Thus, it will be easier for Dajjal to manipulate the minds of the disciples once their souls have uttered the attestation which they have created. You are right. How should I proceed now in your opinion? Answers Dajjal. Iblis reminds him, of the episode of the failed drone strike attempt in which Imam al-Mahdi duplicated himself in 70 different locations. You too have the power to duplicate yourself, Iblis told him. So do the same, he adds. Dajjal agrees with the idea and gets down to business. He holds out his magic ring and says his spells. He then duplicates his being in more than a thousand similar ones. Mystically, he routes them each to the places where the Muslim faithful and the companions of Imam al-Mahdi are found. Each of these duplicates of Dajjal interferes in the dream of the disciples while they sleep and makes their soul repeat the profession of faith created with Iblis. When they wake up, 
the disciples are overcome by doubt and question themselves. They then begin to distance themselves from the Quran, the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, and even if Imam al-Mahdi, until the day they finally joined the cause of Dajjal. During the organization of the life of Dajjal, through the manual of holy history in the Ghaib world, the great helper Paul had expressed to the Prophet his willingness to intervene when this phase arrives when Dajjal will corrupt souls. His wish was to allow Muslims to recognize Dajjal when he appears to them in a dream. To do this, he must appear one-eyed, being able to see only with one eye and not both. The Prophet granted his request and the setting of Dajjal's mission continued in the manual. This is how Dajjal will appear one-eyed in the dreams of Muslims, whom they seek to trick by making them pronounce their own statement of faith. Know that the Lord allowed him, even before his birth, to exercise this mystical power of corruption over Muslims. Thus, those who had followed the recommendations of Imam al-Mahdi, namely the recitation of the Surah al-Kafi, at bedtime and in the morning, see themselves in a dream repeating the first four verses of the Surah to scare away Dajjal who walks away screaming. As for those who had hardly taken their precaution, they see themselves in a dream reciting Dajjal's statement of faith. Upon awakening, they begin to deny their faith in God, in the Prophet, and stray from Imam al-Mahdi's instructions. They end up later rallying the camp of Dajjal. Thus, from Jerusalem, Dajjal invades the home of Muslims and the companions of Imam al-Mahdi through his copies dispersed all over the world. They interfere with their dreams and sometimes appear to be visible to the naked eye. Anyone who disregards Imam al-Mahdi's recommendations ends up joining Dajjal's camp. This trick of Dajjal ends up devastating the Muslim world which begins to rise up. Demonstrations of the faithful are violently repressed by a power in a place entirely acquired with the cause of Dajjal. Worse, manifestations are organized to taunt the followers of Imam al-Mahdi and tell them that their deplorable situation is the result of their opposition to Dajjal. Some of them will eventually defect and join the supporters of the false messiah to hope for a better fate. The daily life of Muslims rhymes with trials and sufferings. The days are punctuated by the difficulties to survive while the nights are marked by a sleep disturbed by the corrupting tricks of Dajjal. Dajjal now considers himself to dominate the world and hold it under his watch. One fine day, he summons the army lieutenants to his office and informs him of his ultimate plan, a project of which the realization will mark the end of his fight against Imam al-Mahdi and the start of the implementation of his political program. When asked by lieutenants about the nature of the project, Dajjal replies, Next Friday, from 8 a.m., take out all the battle tanks, armored, and missiles. Have you decided to go to war? asked the lieutenants. I have decided to tear down the mosque Al-Aqsa. I decided to bring it down to the point of not leaving a single brick standing. And this next Friday at 8 a.m., I want to show Imam al-Mahdi, his companions, and all Muslims that this land is ours. We will know on Friday whether the mosque Al-Aqsa will be the third holiest site in Islam, he tells them. The lieutenants rejoice when they learn of this ultimate goal from Dajjal, who at the same time grants a long-standing wish of the Israeli army to tear down the mosque Al-Aqsa. We have reached the end of this third episode of the history of Dajjal. In the fourth and last episode, we will discover the descent of Prophet Isa ibn Maryam, the end of Dajjal, the reign of Imam al-Mahdi and Isa, and the future of humanity. This story is drawn from the teachings of our honorable guide, Khutb al-Akhtab al-Kabir, Mawlai Sidi Muhammad al-Shaykh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu.